and I'm here to talk about uh, visualizing IoT devices with Akka and Grafana. First, a little bit about myself. I'm from the Netherlands. I work for a company called Lunatech. That's an IT company um, creating backend integrating systems uh, for large enterprises. And furthermore, I'm still finishing my uh, master thesis at the University of Amsterdam. I'm a, a computer, uh, a software engineering student there. And in the weekend, you will mostly find me at scouting, organizing activities for uh, young kids. So, why are we here today? Um, this is a screenshot of a picture of a, an app for my smart thermostat in my house. So, I recently bought a, a new smart thermostat to uh, monitor the temperature in my room. But also, when I'm uh, away from home, the, it should turn off because a lot of people tend to forget that. So, as you can see, uh, you can see the temperature, the humidity, uh, even the solar intensity during the day. So, when the sun is shining, it doesn't have to heat that much. And in the bottom, you see the schedule. So the black bits, that means I'm asleep. And the green one, uh, this means I'm, I'm away. And then during the yellow period, you can actually see that my uh, heating is heating up. Uh, this is all nice and fine, the nice Android app for this. But if you look in the web browser, uh, it doesn't show you anything. So the manufacturer uh, didn't implement the, the graphs so to speak, in the web browser. So I was thinking, can I make a Grafana dashboard for my house with the temperature and the humidity, for example? So again, why? Uh, visualize the temperature, but also be able to add some new devices. They recently replaced my electricity meter with a smart one that I could hook up a Raspberry Pi to it and see the energy usage for my apartment. And I wanted to make a nice proof of concept with some new technologies to learn something new and have fun. So that's the goal. Uh, little disclaimer, none of the scout is production ready, so don't copy paste my slides and use it in production. So um, a little overview of the technologies I'll be using. Uh, I guess you're all familiar with Akka. We've already had some talks about that, so I'm, I'm by no means an expert on Akka. So if you have any questions, uh, there are better talks around to uh, ask those guys, I think. Uh, furthermore, the Play Framework that's built on top of Akka, uh, we use it a lot as well. The, the new thing for me was InfluxDB and Grafana, I guess you all know from uh, monitoring your services uh, at your company or, or some other way. So a brief in, uh, introduction of all those technologies for who you don't know. Uh, the Play Framework is a lightweight and stateless web framework. Uh, it's asynchronous and built on top of Akka. And instead of using raw Akka HTTP, I already like to use Play Framework because uh, you can have the assets in there and HTML templating or asset compilers for uh, uh, CSS and uh, JavaScript as well. And there are some useful libraries in there which we're going to use today. That's Play Web Requests. That's to make requests to external web services. And Play JSON to automatically convert JSON to Scala case, case classes or the other way around. Uh, next up is InfluxDB. Uh, instead of a traditional re relational database that we all use, like Postgres or MySQL, I was thinking, could we use something else? Then I found InfluxDB. It's a time series database. So instead of an index, you have the timestamp as the index with some values. So for example, uh, timestamp, humidity, temperature. And you can also add some tags to this. So you can tag your the measurements or time uh, entries. For example, it came from this device, this customer, or this room, or this zone. That's so that makes it really easy to query the data again. Supposedly, it allows for ingestion of millions of data points per second. Per second, so that makes it really useful for our use case, because if you got a lot of customers and a lot of clients around with a smart thermostat or other devices generating data, we can use InfluxDB to ingest all the data. Furthermore, it allows for real-time querying of the large data sets. So as soon as it's in there, it's indexed based on the timestamp and the tags, so we can query it quite easily. And another cool feature I thought was the downsampling of uh, older data. You can set retention policies, so maybe in a year or so I'm not so interested um, in the exact measurements every second of my room. So I allow it to downsample and only save a record for every hour or every day, or even disregard the data when it's a year old. 
Um, the last cool feature was the HTTP API. So you don't need a custom driver or application to connect to it. Just fire up your browser and you can query the data. So, oh, that's the wrong one. So the last one is Grafana. Uh, that's a platform for analytics and monitoring of about anything out there. You can hook up any data source, so not only InfluxDB, but also Elasticsearch. And there are a gazillion more uh, data stores that you could use. And as soon as you created a nice dashboard, you can easily share it with your uh, fellow developers. So if one team makes a nice dashboard for your services, uh, he can export it, and other teams can use this dashboard as well for their services. So that's the three things we got so far. Then we come to this little architecture that I came up with. Um, we start with the cloud service that is connected to my radiator. That talks to the radiator. And I designed a little actor that knows how to talk to this web service from a radiator to get some statistics from him. Furthermore, I hooked up in a Raspberry Pi to my electricity meter. Um, so that one using a USB connection to my smart electricity meter and exposes a uh, JSON endpoint with all the data. Again, we create a new actor for this guy to connect to. And if we have multiple Raspberry Pis, we spawn multiple actors to get all the data. If you come up with a, a new device in your home, for example, Philips U, and you have the lights in your house, and you want to query the status, you just generate or uh, write a new actor that can connect to uh, your Philips U. Or maybe you have some plants that you want to water. You hook up a, a humidity sensor to a Raspberry Pi and measure how moist the ground it is. And maybe you can do some alerting or some machine learning and predict when you should water your plants based on the temperature in your room and the humidity and the weather outside, for example. Uh, in the middle, you can see an actor that knows how to talk to InfluxDB. So it's just got one job, go store the measurements and all the other actors that are around uh, talk to this actor. And they don't know how to store it, but I just made a measurement and sent it to the central guy who logs everything. And in the end, if you got everything up and running, we can hook up Grafana and uh, show the results. So what do we need to do to get to this? We need three steps. We need first need to get the data. Next, we need to store the data. And at last, visualize the data. So t today I'll take you through those steps on how to do this. Um, what I like to do when I start with something, there is no documentation most of the time because it wasn't an API by a company. I don't have the documentation, so you have to find out what endpoints are there. So mostly use Chrome and inspect with the developer tools what request Chrome is making to display the information. Then we can replicate that request with curl. Well, on the command line with curls, quite a bit tedious to get all the headers and cookies at the right place. So we use something called Postman, which we'll show you later. And in the end, we make the request with some Scala code. So you open up a good old uh, Chrome, you look at the request, and you see, ah, I got some uh, activity data points or some sensor data points in raw JSON. And if you get all this information, you can look around a bit, uh, inspect the header, for example. And we come to the conclusion that we also need an uh, authentication uh, token. When we got this token and the URL structure, we can uh, replicate this request with Postman. So Postman is a little application that you can hook up to Chrome as well. So you get automatically the same request in Postman. And you can tinker around a bit, and you can get the results so you know which steps you need to do in your Scala code to, to make the same request. And they find it quite useful, those small steps. Might be uh, quite simple now that I show it. But sometimes at work, you also got an endpoint that you have to connect to. Nobody knows how it works, or they forgot the documentation, or documentation got lost. So you need to explore how it works. So now we uh, turn to some Scala code. Um, we start with the play web request library. Uh, we get this WS, that's uh, the web request client from somewhere. The play framework can provide us that one. And then we go and call the URL. 
well, f simply fill in the URL and then uh, that will not fill because we don't have a token and we can use uh, the add HTTP headers to provide some tokens or some extra headers or you can also add some cookies or query parameters uh, to the URL and then you simply call the get method but you can also call a post or a put depending on what your API needs. Well, now we don't have anything useful yet. We just got a future of a web response. So we need to do something with that one. We need to process the future. As soon as we got it, we check the status. Maybe you made a mistake or the service is down uh, or you get a gateway timeout or anything. So we check if we got a uh, 200 OK response from the server. And if so, we get the body. Well, as you all know, interpolating some raw body with some raw strings to get some useful data from JSON is quite hard to do right. So, and like the guy told us before, don't write your uh, JSON uh, compiler again. So we use the one from play. Um, this is a little piece of code, how you can get uh, play uh, the web request to read your JSON data as a Scala case class. So you simply fill in the field names and you read them, for example, as a double or a string or any data type you want. And then it automatically makes this measurement case class. But if you got a lot of uh, JSON code out there and Scala code, you don't want to go writing uh, these uh, mappings all manually. So Play provided us with some macros. So we can have automated mapping between some JSON and the Scala case class. This way, play if this uh, implicit fall is in place, play will know how to transform a bit of string into, if it represents JSON, into a case class. Well, the problems I encounter that uh, sometimes the, the, the casing is different, so common for us to use is camel case in uh, properties from a, a case class. So that's the default. But some people used to like uh, use snake case in their uh, endpoints. So we can also bring in this implicit file configuration, which defines a JSON configuration play should use. So as soon as this one is in place, it will read the JSON uh, as snake case and automatically uh, change that back to camel case for your uh, case class. I even had to roll my own because someone was using Pascal case, so the first letter had to be capitalized. Well, this small extension allowed me to read that automatically without writing any manual transformations from JSON to Scala. So now we know how to convert everything. We can uh, combine that together. So we got this response again. Uh, at first, we just called the body for a raw string. But now we uh, say it, uh, get the JSON. So play parses the, the body as a JSON. And map that JSON to a measurement. Well, if anything goes wrong, if it's JSON now, we just get an exception. So a better way would be to call JSON.validate. That we get uh, a Java, um, JSON error or a JSON success. But if you don't care about the error, you can also call as option. Then you get an option of the result of a measurement back. So then you don't get exceptions. So it would be wise to check if your JSON is valid before continuing, otherwise your application will crash. So the result so far, we know how to call the web service with Scala. We got some Scala code in place. We also got automated mapping from JSON to Scala case classes so we can process the results further with some Scala code. But doing this manually for a sensor, like going to a sensor and calling it every time, uh, seems a bit wasteful, so we can automate this. Uh, we need some scheduling. We need to periodically pull one of the sensors, or all the sensors that we have, and they all might be on a different schedule. You can imagine that my electricity sen meter sends out a message every one second, or every 10 seconds, but the temperature in my room doesn't change every second, but every minute or five minutes will be fine as well. Then we uh, 
we could use something like cron so just dump a jar on the server and with cron execute that every time if you got a linux machine but that gets a mess real quick so we turn to something from akka that called the scheduler with the scheduler that's based uh, inside the actor system we can schedule messages to certain actors so we could we now have this actor that knows how to connect to my smart uh, thermostat but and the system scheduler talks to this actor every second or every 10 seconds to get to go and pull your sensor uh, but watch out don't do this for long running jobs for example with cron you could schedule a job every month or every year uh, things could fail your actor system could go down and what happens to the message that would you scheduled a year from now? Nobody knows where that message went. So if you need to use that, uh, I suggest you use Akka Quatch Scheduler, something we use at work as well, to set like uh, monthly or weekly or yearly jobs that have to be executed. So uh, simple scheduling with Akka. This is uh, straight from the Akka documentation. So we first define a tick message, and we create a tick actor that if it receives this tick, it does something useful. In this case, it doesn't do anything yet, but it could act and do something. Next, we get this actor, and with the system.scheduler, we schedule it, for example, once. This could be useful for a job when you boot up your application and you want to execute something not at boot time, but over after a second or after a minute, you could schedule a message to your actor. In the case of uh, our sensor, we want to query it every few, so few seconds. So that's why we use the schedule method. It also takes an initial timeout and the interval, an actor ref, and the message itself. So this is a simple way of scheduling your messages with Akka. Now again, if we got a lot of different uh, devices and actors, this becomes a big mess as well. Because you imagine having some file with all those schedulers defined all on a different schedule. Nobody knows what is happening again. So in a new version of Akka, Akka 2.5, they came up with Akka timers. Akka timers is a small extension for your actor. If you mix in the trade, timers you get this timers uh, method and the same way that we use the schedule before we can now use uh, the single timer or the timers from the actor himself and this timers is bound to the actor himself so no but no other actor can access it it's just himself and he sends a message to himself so the first example we start a single timer just like the schedule once um, with the first tick again. But this time we also need to provide a key. And I'll come back to that one later. And we send that one after one second. So a common structure you could see is like on the first tick after the application booted, we do something useful. Or as soon as the actor has boot, uh, started up, you want to do something useful. And as soon as you've done that initial job, you schedule a message to yourself every five seconds with the message tick, and on the tick, you do something again. Now, this tick key is there in place, so we can cancel the schedule. So imagine you want to stop, uh, after some condition is met, you want to stop your schedule. You can uh, uh, cancel your timer based on that key. So not every uh, scheduled message get lost, but only the ones that you specify by its key. There are some other advantages. Like I said, the, the timer uh, has a key to cancel or replace it, maybe with a new schedule. And timers are bound to the life cycle of the actor himself. So what could happen if I have a the user system that scheduler, my actor dies, but the schedule is still there. I boot up a new actor, and I also set up a new schedule. Now I've got two schedules for that same actor. And then you get end up in a big mess as well. So if you use the timers, that never happens. Akka guarantees, even if it's already in the mailbox, uh, the other messages that were from an old incarnation will be dropped. Um, now, if we combine this together, we got some code 
to query all our sensors. We create an actor per sensor and set some schedule for himself to get this data. But this actor doesn't know how to store the data in the database. So it just sends a message with the measurement to the next guy. So how to implement the next guy that should store all the messages. Uh, we create a new one, or maybe a pool of actors if you got a really big system and want to store a lot of information. But for this use case at home, one single actor that talks to the database should be enough. Uh, it accepts messages, uh, store and store with tags, so we can tag the messages again in InfluxDB. For example, uh, was this room and this device that the measurement came from? Um, like I told you before, InfluxDB has an uh, HTTP endpoint, so we could use, get to use play web request again. But I found some uh, libraries on the internet that were already doing that, so I didn't feel like writing that myself again. So I reused uh, a library. And the cool thing is I found a bug and also contributed that one back, so we can all profit from that one. So even if you use stuff, you can always contribute back and help others with a simple bug or some simple documentation uh, to help the library forward. So how do, does that look like? This is just a small example. It's not complete yet, but I don't want to show all details. Um, it gets this, uh, when the actor boots up, it configures the connection to the database. It sets up the connection, and when it dies, the connection goes away automatically. Uh, it supports one message, or maybe two for the store with tags as well. And when it receives this one, we call uh, dot .store and store the message. Um, this database connection gives us a future of unit, and if we don't do anything with it, our storage actor would just create the future, but it got never executed, so nobody knows what happens. So that's what we call why we call the incomplete method here, and define what we should do on a success or a failure. Maybe you don't want to do anything, but at least you need to call something on your future, otherwise it doesn't get executed. Um, let me show you how that works. This is a more extensive example. Um, play gives us uh, some uh, methods to get the configuration and uh, a, a web request client. And then we build the connection based on our configuration. And here you see the method I showed you before on the slides, but now a full implementation. So if I get a message with uh, a measurement, but without a tag, I send it to myself again. So you can also send messages to yourself. That's quite useful. And then I set the tags uh, is an empty list. If I receive the other message, um, I go to the database and store that one. And on complete, I just log for the time being the message uh, while well, successfully stored or I got an error. So how does this all combine? We got now some data in our database and we want to create some dashboarding. Um, like I said before, Grafana has used uh, a lot of companies for uh, monitoring your servers. That's what we do at work as well. You have some nice dashboards getting the uh, response times of your uh, web servers or the CPU stats and network stats of your server. And I thought, well, we could also use that to visualize the temperature of my room, for example. So I'll show you the real dashboard. This is live in my home. So you can all see it's now uh, 24 degrees in my uh, room and outside is 22 degrees. Uh, it's quite sunny in the Netherlands at the moment. It's a pretty nice weather. You can see, for example, uh, yesterday the top temperature was uh, 27 degrees. And you see that my room also slightly follows the temperature during the day based uh, on the temperature outside. And, well, it's uh, 25 degrees outside, so we don't need any heating. So the heating power of my thermostat uh, is just zero. 
You can also see nicely the yellow line here for the weather outside is the solar intensity. So the sun's shining and it gets brighter and brighter. So it gets warmer, but the temperature follows slightly later. Um, the electricity meter, it does, this one shows you more like a jittery graph because, well, um, the small peaks are the, the boiler for my hot water. That's like every hour uh, uh, going on and checking if it's still warm or heating a bit. Uh, the yellow line here is the total usage during the day. So at the end of the day, that one resets and starts from zero again. So you see the counter. If we uh, zoom in on that one, you see that you ha when you have a peak, peak in the electricity usage, you also have a peak. Uh, the, the line for your counter of the day goes up quicker, as you would expect. Um, these were, for example, yesterday I was already in Kiev, but my housemates were still at home and probably cooking or uh, doing the dishes or the turning on the dishwasher or the washing their clothes or putting them in the dryer or maybe gaming a lot. I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> now, apart from these graphs, you also have this uh, single stat uh, that Grafana has, so it just shows you the latest measurement that we have. But we could also change that to the average temperature of the day. And with Grafana, it's quite easy to add a new graph. So my energy meter also logs how many, much energy it used for uh, the entire uh, existence. So we can simply add a graph for that. We select a new panel, we select the graph method, and then we get an empty panel that's not very useful. So we can edit that one and add some data. I'll make it some bigger for you. Uh, by default, it reads from uh, our default data store InfluxDB. And we can real-time query it here now. So we select from our default uh, data store, we select uh, the energy. Uh, where do we want to get that? Um, we can select the sensor ID. Now, sensor one is only one option. Uh, this was on the look I was looking for. The device, it's called Domotics for my Raspberry Pi, so I have to have that one. Uh, which field do I want? I already got the usage and the counter today. So I had a new graph for the counter. And I'd simply get the mean uh, to get an overview. And as you see, I didn't do anything, but Grafana dynamically loaded this info in the dashboard. And if I change this, for example, to a different field, you get the counter for today. And it's all real-time querying, so you can experiment with creating some dashboards. Uh, sometimes your dashboards can be quite jittery, like I showed you for the energy mo uh, measurements. Uh, it also supports some uh, transformations. So we can select a uh, moving average, and then you get the peaks out. Of course, if you want to see the peaks, then you shouldn't do this, but it can smoothen out your graphs quite nicely as well. As you see, it, it's not so pointy anymore, but a bit more smooth. So that was the dashboard. So some uh, improvements that we could make for bringing this to uh, production. Um, as soon as one actor dies at the moment, it, it is gone. That is not something you want. So you will need to build in some fault tolerance or some ACA supervision to deal with that. Uh, if you have a lot of devices, um, maybe processing uh, the measurement and writing it from adjacent to a Scala case class might be too much work. So we could also dump the raw data into a Kafka topic and later on have some other workers uh, to stream that data to InfluxDB and transform it on the fly. But at least, even if some system goes down, still data is getting into Kafka and the other system can uh, c catch up a bit and put it in uh, InfluxDB. Uh, another thing I like to do is uh, automate my deployments. I actually implemented this uh, last week as well. 
Um, Grafana and InfluxDB have default images for Docker containers, so I can use those. And if you add an SBT plugin called SBT Native Packager, you can simply run SBT Docker Publish, and it publish uh, your Docker container to the Docker Hub. And that way, I can compile my code and push it automatically. Uh, then at my server at home, I wrote a Docker Compose file uh, defining all the different services. And I, with one click, I can boot up the uh, entire stack or even update uh, the applications. So, conclusions for uh, my talk of today. Uh, it's quite easy to create a proof of concept with the Scala e e ecosystem. If you know some libraries uh, and you want to make something nice, uh, you combine them all together and you've got a working proof of concept. I like to choose uh, when I do something at home. I want to try out something new. So in this case, that was uh, InfluxDB and Gravana to try out. So I would advise you, if you start something at home, you want to learn something, don't stick to uh, the good old technologies that you know, but also take it as an opportunity to try something new. And I think with some easy steps, you can make this uh, proof of concept to uh, a fully scalable production uh, system. It, of course, needs some work, but I think if you do a few tweaks, implement some uh, supervision, some error handling, you could already scale this uh, for production. And to conclude, I had quite a lot of fun implementing this. I spent a few evenings at home uh, tinkering with this, and everyone that uh, showed this uh, dashboard of my apartment, they're really, wow, uh, you made a nice dashboard. So that was it. You can find all my code on uh, my GitHub. And even the code for this presentation, you can also find on GitHub. So that was it for me for today. Any questions? Any questions? Right. Uh, yeah, so my question is, uh, how does Grafana connect with, uh, with the data store? Uh, so I I've, uh, I've saw that it is uh, served from your web server. Uh, so it's uh, like some kind of library that is uh, added as a dependency to your backend, and you, and you and, and it generates these uh, all these diagrams that are served, or or is it like some kind of uh, separate application that uh, just uh, receives a connection string for your database and uh, and just streams uh, data from it, re re read the data that is streamed from it? Uh, okay, so I got three applications. Okay, w one application is generating the data. That's the play app with all the actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it goes directly to, to the second app, InfluxDB. And Grafana is a third app, and it natively supports InfluxDB, so I don't know how it connects probably over HTTP to the InfluxDB server. And that's all native to Grafana, so you don't need to do anything special. If I show you the config. Yeah, it's just a simple uh, HTTP connection to InfluxDB, that's it. No, I see. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.